As was mentioned in the uh, introductory email, we'll uh, be doing a, um, a slide presentation that will just do a real like high level overview of some core navigation concepts and then tying that into like specifically what we're doing in the backcountry in terms of uh, uh, navigating in the mountains and like like how we can integrate all this information to be useful to us. Um, while we do have the, uh, um, uh, uh, so we, um, yeah, just a, 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 as a complete um, rundown of the objectives, we'll be uh, trying to provide you with information to plan a, a navigable route for safe uh, for a safe, successful trip. I uh, want to, uh, uh, ensure that you know how to find your location with a bearing in the field. Um, gather information and like uh, what uh, gets you thinking about like decision points like during the course of a trip and uh, how to review and share navigation data in terms of like um, uh, importing and exporting files and um, using the like technologies that we now have available uh, on top of the traditional map and compass approach. So we are making a few assumptions and like, because there's just like so much information to get through, like the, uh, a lot of this may be a review for some, a lot of this may be like overwhelming for others. Um, no like two hour session can cover it all, but we'll try to just stay on track with like some key takeaways and tips that are like backcountry specific. We are assuming that you do have some exposure to uh, uh, paper map and compass use before, and that it's understood that this like um, system is like the backup for um, any like digital tools that you're using. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to solely be relying on Gaia GPS, for example, if you don't have the basics down with the like um, map and compass, like the, the hardware. Um, and that's just like uh, electronic tools are changing rapidly and um, it's really important to understand the principles behind them. So that's what, that's what we're gonna try to cover here. And um, I think we can find ourselves in like an over-reliance on uh, digital tools for navigation. And um, we don't keep like the best navigation like hygiene with our uh, skills in that like, oh, we can get a, a GPS, uh, uh, location on our phone on like a topo map uh, by just uh, unlocking our phone and like if that's the extent that we're uh, engaging with like navigation concepts then it's really easy for things like creating a formal trip route plan or doing um, uh, like uh, uh, like plotting a bearing and doing resection like these skills fall by the wayside unless we like uh, go out of our way to reinforce them so these are the objectives for tonight so I'd like uh, everyone who knows to uh, uh, chime in in the chat, like what are some key features that uh, we have on a, a topographic map? Uh, you can get them from uh, uh, like um, printed through uh, NRCAN or uh, GOBC, uh, like standard paper copies. Uh, and like much of that information that's presented is in one form or another uh, available on like the uh, layers of like the uh, digital mapping platform. But let's uh, just start with like uh, in reference to paper maps, like what are some features that uh, are common to the type of topographic map, uh, maps that we want to use? Contour lines, yes, absolutely. I encourage everyone to contribute uh, any bits of information they may know. Scale, yes, another one. Bodies of water. And as uh, Belinda moves around the screen there, there may be, may be some available hints. Uh, longitude and latitude, UTM, great observation. Glaciers, yeah. I'll include as well in the chat here, just a copy of the um, uh, graphic that we've got on screen in case that's helpful to anyone. Okay, all, all great answers. Um, just add some additional notes. Um, uh, 
like hard copies of maps will have a date of production, uh, a, a legend to like um, link all the symbols to like what they represent, um, terrain features and like uh, color coding. So you can identify vegetation, uh, like uh, tree line, below tree line, alpine areas, glaciers, uh, water bodies were mentioned. Uh, infrastructure, uh, roads, or like different uh, features of the built environment, bridges, dams. Um, some uh, maps have uh, some peaks that are, are labeled, um, which uh, help in the like orienteering. The uh, units, whether the map is in uh, metric or imperial, and then the, the grid lines and the coordinate system that's used. Some uh, maps are solely uh, uh, lat long, some are um, both UTM and lat long, which is the case here. Um, there's that grid uh, currently on screen right now, which uh, uh, denotes um, the map index number and code, which is like part of the um, like national topographic system. Uh, so one uh, like key takeaway here is like that number is not uh, do, like does not correspond to the UTM uh, like zone designator that we're um, uh, going to talk about uh, shortly. Um, I think that may oh and uh, compass the uh, indication of uh, where magnetic north is based on the the date of the uh, like altering of the map and. Typically, the um, information on what uh, uh, like the declination adjustment will be uh, to, uh, for um, magnetic north in like a uh, number of like degrees per year, or proportion of degrees per year. In mentioning the uh, compass, uh, one like key concept is to understand that there's three norths, not just the one. Uh, so we have the, the true north, which uh, is pointing to the, the north pole around the like uh, the axis around which uh, the Earth rotates. Um, the magnetic north, which is the uh, direction that like the magnetized compass needle will point, and this will like, vary from the uh, uh, true north, like depending on the location on the Earth's surface. And then there's the, the grid north, which depending on where we are is like uh, almost indistinguishable for, uh, from uh, true north in that like the, uh, the printed map has the grid lines oriented uh, like with reference to uh, north at the, the, the top of the map. But uh, uh, that uh, there, there is a discrepancy based on like needing to map on the, this like 2D plane onto like a, a, a 3D surface. Um, so as you like get closer and closer to either of the poles, there's like more of a, a, dis a discrepancy between those two. But the, like the, the key takeaways here are that uh, we're when we're uh, doing work with the uh, uh, like paper map, we're uh, referring to the grid north. The work with the uh, compass, we, we may uh, be using the compass with the uh, paper map and use both grid north and uh, true north, but the compass needle points to true north. Uh, so, sorry, magnetic north. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and uh, these are perhaps settings that can be adjusted on your uh, digital mapping platform. So. Uh, if you have a uh, like electronic compass uh, sensor in uh, your smartphone, uh, like Gaia GPS uh, has a toggle for whether the um, uh, the, the compass is giving you the, the uh, true north or magnetic north uh, designation. Now we'll uh, segue to coordinate systems, which could be a whole to our um, uh, presentation in and of itself. But uh, uh, I remember when I first learned about geography, the, uh, the system that was used and that most people are going to be familiar with are, are lat long and uh, uh, many digital uh, latitude and longitude, that is. Um, and the uh, digital mapping platforms often like default to this coordinate system. And uh, 
This is using uh, like measuring the uh, angle from the the equator towards either pole, at, uh, like from zero to 90, or from the prime meridian uh, east or west, uh, 180 degrees. Uh, this is a useful system for when you're um, maintaining a heading by sea or air and like wanting to uh, keep uh, going in a straight line, but we're often not going in a straight line on land. And what we're uh, going to be uh, emphasizing here and it's like the best practices for backcountry navigation is the use of the uh, UTM or Universal Transverse Mercator System, which is a bit more uh, complicated to concisely explain, but it is useful in that it's uh, uh, based around the metric system and each of these uh, um, zone designators that are uh, that, like that comprise the globe are a uh, effectively a uh, square of like a thousand kilometers by a thousand kilometers that then make a lot of the math more uh, like uh, simplified when we're working in uh, kilometers and meters. Um, one of the uh, items on the map that we actually didn't uh, call out or just uh, I uh, forgot to mention it was the, the datum that is used as well, which uh, you'll see uh, typically either NAD 83 uh, or WGS 84, NAD uh, 27. These are um, like specifications of the, uh, like the shape of the earth basically, like how does this 2D plane of uh, UTM zones wrap onto this 3D surface. Kind of liken it to uh, taking a bunch of like little mini post-it notes and like putting them on on a beach ball. They're like, it's not a per per like perfectly round, perfectly spherical shape. There's like uh, strange um, uh, like irregularities in the shape. Uh, it's important for, for purposes of navigation to know that your reference coordinates are in a particular datum and know how to uh, change between the two. I, I, uh, in, in the links, there was a, um, uh, like an online tool to uh, convert between the older NAD27 and NAD83. Um, just one other like useful tip because even with Gaia GPS, if you specify in the search box a UTM coordinate, uh, Gaia will still refer to it in uh, latitude and longitude. And one um, gotcha or like thing to keep in mind is that there are like different ways to express latitude and longitude. It can be in degrees, minutes, and seconds, or decimal seconds, or it can be in degrees, minutes decimal minutes or just degrees with like a decimal number following. And they uh, like some platforms will let you uh, switch between these, but the, like there's uh, uh, like conversion is required. You can't just uh, add the like decimal part, like pretending that it's uh, minutes or seconds, it's not gonna give you the right location. So I think that's all we'll say about latitude and longitude, but for reading a map that does have a UTM uh, coordinate system, well, uh, there are like a few things to keep in mind. Whereas latitude and longitude specifies a coordinate with uh, the first part being how far north and south, the second part being how far east and west. Uh, UTM is in reverse and it provides some extra information that functions as a bit of um, like built-in validation. So in the example here, we have uh, 10S, which is the uh, grid zone designator. The uh, 10 part refers to the like strip or column, or vertical band of like the zones that run north, south, all the way around the earth. And uh, here the S indicates the um, the latitude band that runs like um, uh, parallel to the equator. Um, that uh, 
the prefix is required to make sense of the uh, like numerical data that follows. So they'll, they'll, these numbers repeat for every one of those zones all around the world. So when, when specifying a UTM coordinate, that, uh, that prefix is required. Um, there's also uh, a, like a note that the, the northing, or the, the, the second value on the right there, is the distance measured from the equator, uh, whereas the uh, easting, the, the uh, um, uh, 700, uh, uh, 700 uh, 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 700, uh, 706800 meters is um, the measurement within that individual uh, zone designator from what's called a, a false origin to the, uh, the far west side of that like individual uh, square on the Earth's surface. So um, that's why like one has six digits and, and like in this case, the other has seven. Uh, some sometimes there will be a shorthand too in reference, like like when the the, the reference of a given map is established, where it's just the uh, uh, like uh, uh, like a, a six a six digit number, which will correspond to uh, the uh, like kilometers uh, like uh, uh, three digits for the like um, kilometers to the East, uh, like, um, and then three digits for the kilometers to the um, uh, north in like intervals of uh, 100 meters. So when you see a, a six digit UTM coordinate and have the reference frame of a particular UTM zone designator, you can uh, break it down into its two component parts. And then that uh, will provide one of these like 100 meter by 100 meter squares that you can uh, uh, like identify as a as a location, and this is helpful in like uh, map and um, uh, paper navigation where you don't know the precise like uh, decimal coordinate in UTM. Um, one uh, uh, mnemonic uh, to just remember about. Uh, Again, UTM being expressed as uh, the easting and then the northing is that uh, to uh, uh, enter the, the coordinate, you want to go across the hall and then up the stairs, as opposed to, again, lat long, it's the other order. And you cannot reverse them around. You're not going to have the right coordinate. So next slide. OK. So we aren't in the field to be taking um, bearings, but uh, one one like key thing to, to keep in mind with like uh, uh, map and compass navigation and like route planning is that like the, the compass itself is like a very like clever ruler that uh, you don't have to necessarily be using the um, the the magnetic uh, needle. Um, like two two uh, key skills to have are like taking a bearing on a map where you're using you're orienting the the um, uh, bezel uh, to follow like uh, the uh, line from like between locations. Perhaps it's uh, the uh, like following a segment of a trail in the um, trip route plan that you're putting together, and then just using uh, the bezel to see like what that um, uh, like angle corresponds to based on the uh, grid north of the paper map. And when doing so, like we're not concerned of it being like a, a magnetized uh, device. So that's uh, like, again, a high level takeaway that like wanna know what we're using the, the compass for. Um, one an, another tip I'll note that like uh, there are a lot of like uh, varieties of compasses with uh, like uh, different price points and features. Um, 
while I think we're all coming here from the, the Northern hemisphere, some uh, have like a, a, a compass needle that's magnetized that is like uh, accurate in both the uh, Northern and Southern hemispheres. Others are like specific to a hemisphere and that's like important to know for international travel. Uh, the other uh, key function that we want to look at, uh, that we won't get to practice uh, tonight, is taking a bearing in the field and like the proper use of the compass for uh, establishing that bearing. So in this uh, uh, use case, the, the first thing that needs to be done is to uh, adjust the declination on the compass. And that, again, the declination value will be found either online or through the paper map reference, like based on the year and the like how the um, magnetic north is moving. That way, you know that uh, the uh, orienting uh, arrow is offset from like the, the north on your bezel. Um, then once the declination is uh, adjusted, like uh, if you're wanting to find like what, uh, basically like taking a, uh, a bearing from the real world towards a, a peak or a lake or whatever uh, feature that you're citing, and uh, like transferring that uh, to a map, having the, uh, the compass uh, lined up using the, the uh, uh, sighting and then the, uh, if it has a mirror at 45 uh, degrees to, with, with the compass level to um, adjust the bezel ring so that the uh, orienting arrow, like the, the red, um, arrow that like circles around inside the compass will align with the uh, uh, magnetic arrow, giving you a, uh, a reading um, uh, at the, uh, the, the target you're pointing at, and then the opposite uh, reading being the back bearing, which is 180 degrees uh, uh, different, like uh, pointing in the other direction. Uh, so with, with that information, you can then uh, tran transfer the, uh, uh, the angle onto a paper map with like a, a pencil and like the compass as a, uh, a ruler to um, let you uh, know that, okay, you, you are at some, some point on that uh, line. And if you can, then yet another um, bearing at a, like another terrain feature that is visible. These two uh, lines can intersect, and this uh, this process is called uh, resection. Uh, colloquially, it's uh, triangulation, but uh, triangulation itself is actually uh, uh, somewhat different. But uh, again, the the key takeaway is to think of the uh, Compass is like a multi-tool. Uh, you have the the magnetic properties, but there's also the uh, ruler and the scale. And uh, many compasses will have a scale with like meter markings that correspond to a one to fifty thousand scale topo map, which makes it really easy to just line up the uh, compass like on top of the map and see what the actual distance is as you move it around. Um, also, typically, it will have a string which can be used to like kind of snap to a path uh, if it's a, like an irregularly shaped trail, and then use the string to like line up against your map's um, uh, legend of the um, the scale, so that you have an easy way to find out uh, how long that path is. And um, some of, some compasses also have a, a clinometer. I don't know if you can see it in this uh, one, but like uh, basically giving you a way to measure like the uh, slope angle, which uh, is incredibly helpful in avalanche terrain, but also helps like tie in um, uh, the, like uh, how um, the width of contour lines on the topographic map uh, relate to like the, the measured slope angle. So just, uh, yeah, don't, uh, dismiss the, the, the compass as like just a, a single use tool. There's like, uh, like a, a lot of functionality and like uh, signaling uh, mirror as well as like uh, a multi-tool and like 10 essentials. 
so to speak to a uh, map scale, um, the, the previous example we showed was a map with uh, uh, 1 to 250,000 scale, uh, which at, at that, um, like a, uh, that size map is looking at approximately a, um, 120 kilometer by 120 kilometer square. And I guess the, the question that comes up is like, okay, what, what is the scale that's most useful in the backcountry for mountaineering? And uh, in fact, the um, maps that you can get through uh, NRCAN or GOBC, like it is uh, one to 50,000, which is particularly useful at like the human scale of like a fold foldable map that uh, you can use with a, a compass to um, still like see terrain features. And, and like I said, the, the scale on mini compass compasses is built around one to 50,000. So for like a uh, fold out map, one to 50,000 is like approximately like a, a 24 by a 24 kilometer square, um, which is the sort of um, area that is like coverable within like a day or two. And um, like there's a the trade off there between like level of detail and uh, total overall area that you can see. Um, of course, with like digital tools, the um, you have the ability to like zoom in dynamically, which is a, a, a big plus. Um, and uh, like as was mentioned in um, like the prep for the course, like having the uh, um, grid enabled too, like um, gives you like a, the reference frame of like what uh, uh, like size like is available in like a, an area that's on screen for any given uh, level of zoom. So we mentioned uh, contour lines and um, just some uh, labeling here. We have the, the index contour lines that are at like set regular intervals, the, the ones with like a, a, a thicker um, uh, like line segment uh, or path. And uh, in this case, it's every uh, 50 meters that this uh, we see one of these uh, index uh, contours. And that's like 50 uh, meters at the change in elevation. And uh, we'll uh, like, uh, this can be uh, positive or negative and indicated as such. Um, but the, the contour interval, the, like the, the space between these contour lines, it, it uh, like represents that average change over the course of that uh, horizontal distance. So uh, integrating that information, like the close, the, the narrower those contour inter intervals, the, the, the closer the contour lines, that corresponds to a, a steeper slope angle, uh, either up or down. And like that uh, direction, directionality has to be interpreted through uh, context uh, clues. The, the key takeaway here though, is that the, um, like the like larger the, the scale of the map, the less information is uh, available in each uh, contour interval. And it's the, like it's representative of an average. Um, and uh, the narrower those intervals get, the more, uh, uh, more weight of evidence is given to like, okay, this is impassable terrain. Or this is like a, an incredibly steep feature that's going to factor in to the trip route plan. Uh, so we'll uh, use an example here where um, without uh, any of the um, numbers like on the, the bottom half of the diagram, we don't specifically know if uh, this is a, a, a couple of hills or a couple of depressions, uh, although there are some clues that we can interpret. When, when we add the um, uh, elevation labels on the uh, uh, contour lines, it becomes uh, clear that we have um, like a uh, 
peak or a hill and like a, a sub peak and uh, uh, at uh, location B we have a, a saddle a, like a, a mountain pass or a call. Um, also note that the um, uh, we uh, may be in the field and have a like incomplete information on what we see. Like if we're at the, the triangle uh, on the horizon at the uh, right of the diagram and looking up uh, at um, this ridge line, we may see only point C at 193 meters. And from this perspective, it's like a, a false summit because uh, we don't have line of sight to the, the higher summit. So uh, another bit of information to integrate. Okay. All of this is like, like uh, subtle clues about um, reading the terrain and un understanding like what like these changes in contour lines mean, along with the other features of the map, like um, the presence of vegetation, presence of water bodies, um, and we want you to think about not just identifying these bits of inf information, but like what do those mean for travel time, uh, the like type of travel that can be done. Um, like, are there like uh, bottlenecks that uh, like for things like uh, creek crossings, right? And uh, like, start uh, thinking of like reading the terrain on the topographic map, not just by uh, the elevation, but like what that does in terms of your ability to move um, on foot through these areas. So uh, if like what one like uh, uh, key thing to remember is like, like uh, steep elevation if uh, like, moving uh, up in elevation will like increase travel time and uh, having to um, navigate through gullies or like changes where like the contours are like uh, moving around uh, like uh, features like uh, creeks and drainages or whatnot that effectively adds like a much more convoluted path even if you aren't changing elevation. And we'll uh, elaborate on that a bit in the Next slide. So uh, let, let, let us know in the chat, um, from what you see here, what's at a, a higher elevation? Um, Lost Lake or this uh, settlement of Tower Junction? Yes, that's right, Lost Lake. We may not have um, like, dir uh, like direct um, elevation data to go on here, but we do have clues in that um, we see that there's a, a creek that's uh, flowing down towards Tower Junction and the um, like iconic shape of a drainage is this uh, kind of uh, pinched V where like the uh, effectively like a, um, uh, a creek is like uh, <laughs> kind of er eroding this path. Um, and the, the wider side of that V is like pointing down slope. Um, uh, so so with, with like that bit of information, we can infer in fact that uh, uh, Lost Lake is a bit higher because we have all of these like encircling uh, elevation bands that uh, bring it up above Tower Junction. Um, also, we see like some evidence of like just how steep the trail is going up from Tower Junction to this um, uh, like a ridge towards the south or the bottom of the map, we see that there's like uh, switchbacks leading up that slope. And like, that's a good, um, like, again, a clue for like reference, like with that, like how wide those, uh, those contour bands are. Uh, the trail does not proceed in like a, a linear path. It's in like having to uh, keep the, s the slope angle lower in order to um, uh, get like up that vegetated slope. So 
all these little bits of information should like factor into like the uh, understanding of whether a slope is going to be passable in a, a straight line or if it's a bushwhack or if it's like uh, too steep to reasonably progress down at like a uh, um, constant rate of speed, like depending on the um, uh, like competency of the group. Another factor is um, like we have some uh, marsh uh, uh, identified in uh, uh, next to Lost Lake there. And like that could be a um, navigation hazard. It could, it could be impassable. It could be a highly seasonal thing too, right? So these are the sorts of features that should um, like stand out a bit if they are in the path of a, a trip route plan. And um, raise the like need to uh, know before you go and uh, see what these like what other people have said about like these features and doing like research about them online, for example. Uh, so same with like uh, crossing uh, creeks, uh, like depending on the time of year, the, like, how um, much uh, water is flowing, and um, uh, any of these bottlenecks will. It like should be noted as uh, like particular points in a like step by step route plan. So I think that's all of the uh, uh, presentation on like the the high level non digital background um, a bit for a workshop. But uh, now we'll. Try to reinforce that knowledge a bit with a uh, pop quiz. So I'll uh, pass it off to Belinda here. Yes, it's a pop quiz. Um, I encourage everyone to take part in this and it is optional. So if you want to just watch, you can, but I encourage everybody uh, to take part. It's for fun. We're not marking this. Um, it's just to, to uh, practice these skills a little bit and have a little bit of fun. And we do have a prize at the very end. All right, so there's lots of different navigation tools that we can use. And in this next little activity, um, we're going to uh, reveal what these different navigation tools are um, after you tell, the, tell us what they could be in the chat. So in the chat, if you can name a navigation tool, then I will start uncovering some pictures from this slide. A compass, yes. A map altimeter, okay. So I'm gonna start uncovering some of these. So we've got, um, our, I'm using the compass actually as, um, as a, a slope uh, angle thing, just to show different ways. Um, and then a GPS, we've got that. So um, I've got, for the altimeter, um, it's actually a watch. So that's what I usually use as an altimeter. Um, and then GPS. So this one is, it's GPS and also it's an in-reach. I, I don't have a GPS unit, so you get a nice little in-reach um, in the photo. How about some other things? The sun, yes, you have lots of, uh, so uh, my general thing about this is, is the sky. And um, so you have the stars, the sun. So here you have a photo with the, the North Star. So you can tell which direction North is in. How about some other ones? Think creatively. What other, what other things can help you with navigation? Moss on trees. Um, I don't have a photo of moss on trees, but yes, that way you can tell um, which direction you're, you're going in. Trail markers, yeah. So here's a trail marker from the Baden-Powell Trail. It's an example. We've got a few others. Cairns, yeah, cairns are awesome. That's um, kind of like one type of trail marker. Let's think about some other ones. Yes, your brain. <laughs> Brain's also really, really important. Or more snow on north, north faces. Yes, that also is a thing um, because it doesn't melt as much. Uh, so uh, for this, there's a, there's a peak there. So it's just kind of visual cues where you, if you know there's a certain peak in a certain direction. 
Um, yeah, the fall line also is uh, really helpful. Um, creeks, yeah. So I've got a picture of a creek here. Handrails, yeah. That's, I don't have a photo of that, but there's lots of natural features that can be used as handrails. So I'm just gonna uncover these last two. Um, so this one is kind of a GPS. Um, it's uh, like kind of the mapping uh, programs such as Gaia or CalTOPO and that type of thing. Um, and another one here is, uh, is satellite imagery and photos. So it's kind of like evidence from other people who might've been there before or looking at uh, different types of models to get an idea of what type of terrain you might be going into. Okay, and so with those different navigational tools, um, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at um, more of a, a digital one, which is Gaia GPS. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about something that was uh, just named in the chat, which is uh, handrails. Um, the concept of a handrail is that if there are certain features that you can use um, as something to keep on one side of you or where you know that you'll be able to either see um, or, or be close to that feature while you're traveling, then that's a way to help you know where you are. And this helps, especially when it's really, really hard to see. So it could be that you're in really thick, uh, thick forest or it could be that you have very little visibility. Um, and so a handrail is, is really, really useful. So a creek's are really good for handrails or in um, in the alpine you can say use a rock band or a ridge line um, as a way to to kind of just follow along that feature as you go and then another thing that is uh, kind of like similar to the concept of a, a handrail is is aiming off and so a lot of times the most efficient way of navigating through terrain is not actually the most direct way. It's um, a way that allows you to be able to get to your, your destination without say getting too lost. Or sometimes um, it's, it's just an easier way to, to get around an obstacle. So for instance, um, a way that you can aim off uh, in this example with, with the falls is that you know that the falls are there and you don't wanna have to end up like at the waterfall. Um, and so if you know the falls are, are kind of directly in front of you, you're going to end up, say, like making sure you have a bearing that is slightly off from where those falls are. And so that way you can um, end up making sure that you're below it. So you're like, OK, I know the falls are in this direction and I'm going to take a bearing that's um, say if this is going going east, it's going to go a little bit more north than that. Um, and so that way you can like kind of definitely make sure you avoid your obstacle. And then now that we've uh, talked a little bit about, you know, kind of traveling through different terrain and that type of stuff, um, we're going to do an exercise uh, coming up uh, on route planning. And the hint that Rob gave was that it's gonna be in the Sigur Lake area. But before we get to that, there's a, a little uh, thing that we'd like to share, which is about just figuring out how long your trip might take. And one useful tool is, it's called the Munter calculation. And, and it's just a really rough way to figure out um, based on the distance that you're traveling and how much elevation you are going to be changing how long it's going to take. And so the, the pieces of the mentor calculation are the, the distance that you're traveling in kilometers. And then because going up and down um, different types of terrain uh, does make you go a little bit slower or a little bit faster, then you have your elevation there in meters. Um, and then your pace is kind of based on what your pace would be on like a flat equivalent. And there's a huge uh, range of what that pace might be depending on the conditions, depending on your mode of travel and your group ability. So it can range everything from if you're breaking trail in super deep snow, um, and it's like a multi-day mountaineering pack, it's super heavy, then you could be going as slow as one to two kilometers per hour. Actually, I'm not gonna call that slow. I'm gonna call that a good pace. Um, and 
Then on the other side of it, if you are say going ski touring, then it's like a nice kind of uh, very, very consistent descent. You're not going up and down very much. The terrain's kind of marrow, kind of mellow, like just enough so that you're sliding down the entire way. Um, then you can go like say eight to 10 kilometers an hour. And then everything else that's in between hiking with the day pack, um, going with an overnight pack, then those types of paces, those um, are really good to, to be able to just like gather data as you do other trips to get a sense of what your pace would be. So like keep an eye on when you're doing a trail, like how long different sections take you because the more data that you can collect about um, how fast you are moving through different terrains, the more that's gonna help you to be able to plan for a trip in the future. Um, but just a few things to, to remember when you're doing these types of calculations is that sometimes your terrain really can dictate um, your, your time. So a lot of times it seems like you go faster when you go downhill, but if it's say like really, really steep or you've got like, you know, obstacles to navigate around, then going downhill can actually take uh, a, quite a bit of long time, maybe longer than going uphill. Um, and then also remember that we don't usually go out on trips and we like leave from the parking lot and we don't stop until we get back to the parking lot. I mean, some people do that because they like, you know, want to do like something on a certain time or like do it as like an endurance record. But most of the time we do have time for transitions and for breaks. And then very, very important to add contingency time. So, so the way that I usually do it is, um, I have um, a contingency of at least an hour for like a day activity so that I plan to be done um, whatever that I'm doing at least one hour before the sun sets. And I touched a little bit about uh, the various types of online tools that are available for, for planning. Um, and so you can see all the different logos of those tools there. And just a I guess uh, instead of like kind of going through what each of these do, there's just a few things that you want to look for in one of these tools. So I'm going to actually switch my screen over and show you um, an example with Gaia. This is um, a tool that you can use for free um, and you can use it on a web browser or on your phone. And a lot of these other tools, um, they have similar capabilities. So things that you can look for, the ability to have uh, different types of layers. And so for instance, with this one, the regular topo gives you contour lines, it gives you kind of like terrain features um, and, and some like kind of wayfinding features as well, such as labels. And then you can also turn on lab uh, layers such as a satellite uh, layer so that you can kind of see what that terrain would actually look like. So having different layers is really, really helpful. Some other things that you want might, you might want to look for are the ability to add waypoints like that, um, the ability to add routes. So for example, you can do a hiking route where it actually helps like snap to the trail. And what's kind of helpful here is you can also see the elevation profile as, uh, as you're planning your route. Some other things that um, are like potentially useful are um, the ability to just like save, I'm, I'm not logged in right now, but you can save your different features. Um, you can change your map preferences. So actually put it onto metric and, and UTM. Uh, a feature I really like is the ability to import and export uh, different types of data, as well as to be able to print your map. So you can set up your map how you want it to be set up and then print it. And then as I mentioned before, that having the ability to use it on say a phone and a computer allows you to say plan everything out on your computer. And then you can use that same plan when you're on your phone. Tracking is also uh, sometimes helpful, although that can drain your battery. Um, and uh, another thing that is uh, that I, I find also helpful is uh, the ability to share 
your data with other people. So when I have someone who's uh, multiple people say in my group and I want to have a track that uh, all of us uses, then it's like nice and quick to be able to just say, okay, I'm just going to like add you onto uh, the shared track. So those are just some of the features um, that are, are good to look for when looking at a web tool. So now we're going to get to our activity, which is um, doing a root plan. So this is an example here of a sample root plan for the Sigur Lake area. And what we're going to do is um, we'll kind of just like do Rob and I, we're going to do a banana example of like, this is how we would do say the beginning of a root plan. And then after that, we're going to put everyone in breakout routes to do the rest of the root plan 